uh, not long ago, uh, my wife Tiffany and I decided that we were going to work on uh, finishing our basement. And my handyman skills, much like my preaching skills, are good enough to get you in trouble. You think something's a good idea and then quickly find out, not so much. <clears throat> and so, I don't know if any of you have ever taken on a, a home project like this with your spouse. Uh, you can sometimes find, this wasn't our case, but you can sometimes find that your visions aren't the same. And even if they are the same, the process of getting there is not the same. And so often, uh, as I was working, Tiffany would come uh, downstairs and, and she would say, well, why, what are you doing here? Why are you doing that like that? And I would try to explain what I was doing and she would think I was foolish. And, uh, but eventually she would say, you know what, I don't get what you're doing. I don't share the vision, but I trust you. You've done well enough this far that, that I will trust you. And your judgment. And in the same way, for those of you that, that don't know, my wife Tiffany is a, an RN uh, in the neonatal intensive care unit at Children's. So she has a pretty good grasp on babies. So in our household, uh, when our kids are sick, I don't have any say, obviously. I don't want any because I'm going to spaz out anyway. I go to her. She has the knowledge. She has the experience. My trust is in her in those areas because she's never let me down. And so what do we do in our lives when it hands us something that we don't understand? And what happens here as a church as we enter this season of change and this time of transition? And I think the answer is pretty simple. We trust in the one who has never let us down. Amen. We trust in God's timing and we trust in his provisions. And so this morning we're going to dive into the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to try to condense a lot of things down to one morning. Uh, we could easily make a series out of this, so I'm going to try to keep it under two hours. Uh, just <laughs> stick with me. But before we do that, why don't we pray? Father God, we just, uh, we just thank you for your mercies and for your blessings. Father, uh, we know you are a God who uh, never lets us down. And so we pray that uh, into our lives. Father, we pray that as we enter into this text, um, that we see the things that you want us to see uh, this morning. Uh, Father, we just thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name that I pray. Amen. Amen. So if you'll turn with me to Nehemiah, the first chapter, starting in verse 1. And the words will be on the screen if you want to follow along that way. And this is the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakali. In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the providence are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love and obey him, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to, be, to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. You see, the Israelites here in this point in our story, they were in exile. They were separated and living apart from one another. They had made it to their promised land, yet time and time again they had turned their back on God. They had wandered away from him, and so Jerusalem was allowed to be overtaken. 
Their city walls were destroyed, their temple was destroyed, and they were driven from their homes. Most of them in exile, a lot of them in slavery. And at this point in the story, some of them had begun to return to Jerusalem. They had actually rebuilt the temple. But their city wall was still in shambles. They were vulnerable. They were left open to attack. And that's why Nehemiah was grieved at this point. And I think there's some similarities to this story in the book of Nehemiah and what's happening here in our church community. For those of you that are visiting with us, uh, it's been announced recently that our senior pastor is uh, retiring after nearly 37 years of service. And he has served us faithfully. He has been a God-fearing people-loving, man of integrity. And I've heard it said that, that we're in a grieving period at this point. And I think that's a fair assessment. I think it's fair to say that we are in a time of mourning for a period. And I think it's important, it's good, and it's proper for us to honor Kevin as he enters a new chapter in his life. And in that honor, I think it's appropriate to mourn. But knowing Kevin as I do, I know he would say this was never Kevin's church in Sardinia, but it's Christ's church in Sardinia. And so in our honor of him, it's even more important for us to carry on Christ's ministry here in this community. And so I think there's some practical applications in this text if we want to rebuild our lives and if we want to continue to build this church. And so like Nehemiah, I think the first step we have to take is rebuilding through prayer. We see actually that Nehemiah, it says, took several days where he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. And we see several elements in his prayer that I think we need to copy into our own prayer lives. And in fact, there's a lot of similarities as we read that, if you picked up on them, between his prayer and the Lord's prayer. The first is this, we see that he worshipped. He started his prayer out with worship. He said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenants of love. Much like Nehemiah, we need to start our prayer with worshiping our great God. The second is this, repentance. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you, and we have not obeyed the commands given us. The third thing we see is Nehemiah prays God's word. He recalls the words of the prophets that yes, there would be an exile, but if they were to return to God, they would be returned to Jerusalem. And the last thing is a request. We see him say, give me success today by granting me favor before the king. I think those are some things we can incorporate into our own prayer life. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the things we have put together that's available at the Welcome Center is a pastor search prayer guide. And all it does is lay out some thoughts that you can be praying over and some scripture that uh, goes along with those thoughts. So we would encourage you to pick one of those up uh, this morning. Uh, Spend some time as an individual and as families praying over that as we go through this process. But we see in the life of Nehemiah that prayer was not an excuse for inaction. It was his basis for every action. You know, often in a Christian's life, this is pretty well known, that if you ask a Christian to do something and they say they'll pray about it, what do they mean? They mean no. That's that's my excuse. I'll pray about it. I'm not doing it. Or we sit on an idea for month after month or even year after year because we need to pray about it. But Nehemiah didn't use his prayer life as an excuse to do nothing. But he did use it as a base for his every action. Let's look at a few more texts in the second chapter of Nehemiah, verse 4. He's having a conversation actually with the king. Nehemiah is a cupbearer to the king. And he's going before him and he's asking him, permission to go and rebuild another city's walls. And and in this conversation, the king said to him, what is it you want? And Nehemiah pauses even during that conversation, and it says, then I prayed to the God of heaven. In 4.8, it says, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. And then in 6-9, they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. 
You see, Nehemiah in that first chapter clearly set aside some time to be alone with God and to fast and pray. But that's not all he did. We see that he actually carried on a prayer dialogue In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. And that's what we see applied into Nehemiah's life here. We see him pause throughout his life while he's in conversation, even while he's under attack and facing opposition. And later on, if we continue reading, even in his successes, we see Nehemiah pause for prayer. And so the first way you're going to rebuild your life, the first way we're going to continue to build this church is through prayer. But we also need to be ready to rebuild despite opposition. <clears throat> now, I know I uh, maybe don't look like it any longer, but at one point I was at least averagely athletic. Okay? And I'm a very competitive person. If we're playing something, I want to keep score and I want to win. Okay? I don't want to just play for the fun of it. I'm a competitive person. And my favorite sport growing up was always basketball. If you drove past my house as a young man, there was a good chance you were going to see me outside playing basketball. You think with all that practice, I'd have gotten better than I was. But, but I remember one, uh, one game in particular. We were playing in a summer league game in Mason County. So we were playing seven or eight games that day. It held no significance whatsoever. But one of the things our team prided ourselves on was the fact that we gave up no easy baskets. Okay, there, there was going to be nothing easy. Defensively, we were going to do our best. And so in this particular game, uh, the other team had just scored a basket, and I was taking the ball out of bounds, and I throw it, and the pass is intercepted by a Mason County player. Now, if I was a better student, I would have understood the physics of about what was about to happen. But this guy was significantly larger than I was, but I thought, no easy baskets. I'm going to be really honest with you. I thought, I'm going to foul him. He's, he's, he is not going to get the ball to the hoop. I'm going to make him earn his two points by going to the free throw line. And so this young man went up. I went up with the intent of doling out some punishment. And I have never been hit so hard in my life. <laughs> and so as I went to the ground and my head hit the ground and then bounced back up, I remember watching the ball go through the hoop and, and in my haze looking at the referee who's calling the foul, so now he gets a a chance at a three-point play, and thinking, what just happened? What just happened? I went up with this intent, with this plan, that this was going to be reversed, right? He was going to be the one thinking, what just happened? But despite my plans, I was ran over. But doesn't life hit us like that sometimes? We're all geared up, we have our best plans, and then all of a sudden we're lying on our backs thinking, what in the world just hit me? Maybe you've saved up for retirement all your life and something comes out of nowhere and you lose your savings. Or maybe you've worked really hard on your health. You've done everything right. You've ate right. You've exercised. And yet the cancer comes anyway. Or maybe you fought the same sin over and over again. And yet despite your best efforts, despite your best plans, you found that you were prone to wander like the Israelites. Or maybe you're trying to walk in God's path. You're trying to do the best that you can, and yet you find those people that were supposed to be your friends are the ones most in opposition. I've used this quote before, but anytime I can quote Mike Tyson in a sermon, I'm going to do it. (laughs) Mike Tyson says this, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. You see, though, Jesus never promised us that we would not face opposition. And I know there's some people that's going to say, well, hold on a minute. What about these verses that says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. And we cherry pick these verses and we think that we can apply them to every situation. But if we dive a little deeper into the Bible, we understand that that's not the case. In John 16, verse 33, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Not you might, not you may, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In 2 Timothy, Paul warns Timothy that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And in James 1, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Wait a minute, this is getting a little doom and gloom, isn't it? Why would God ask such things of us? That's not fair. 
David Platt wrote this in his book, Radical. Not even dying a martyr's death is classified as extraordinary obedience when you are following a Savior who died on a cross. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58 says this, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. A Jewish rabbi, Rabbi Tarfon, said this, It is not incumbent on you to finish the work, but nor are you free to desist from it. You see, despite whatever opposition you may be feeling, despite our differences, despite our challenges, despite whatever it is that Satan may throw at us, our labor for the Lord is not in vain. That's been promised us. So we're going to rebuild through prayer. We're going to rebuild despite opposition, and we're going to rebuild on God's promises. Any of you ever broken a promise? Nobody else but me? Any of you have kids and broken a promise? How's that work out for you? Okay, I have taken the words I promise out of my vocabulary. If I tell my kids I promise, and then something totally out of my control happens, right, they're perfectly reasonable three-year-olds and say, I understand, Dad. No. No, all they know is dad promised, dad lied, right? And so I have taken those words out of my vocabulary. There is much out of my control in life. However, Nehemiah understood that that's not the case with God, that he's a God who fulfills his promises. He is a God where nothing is out of his control. And we see that as Nehemiah is praying the words of the prophets in chapter 1. And he's praying the words that there'll be a return to Jerusalem. But if you return to me, he says, in recalling the words of the prophets, and obey my commands, then even if you're exiled people at the farthest horizon, I will gather from there, them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. You see Nehemiah recalling the promises that God made towards his people. Now, we aren't in exile obviously today. But what are some of the promises that God has made to us that we can apply to our lives? Now, there's, there's a lot more than what we're going to talk about this morning, but I want us to focus on three things. The first is this, God promises good to those who love him. If you'll turn to Romans 8, verse 28, and it says this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, you might be saying, hold on just a minute. You just spent 10 minutes telling us how not everything is going to be good all the time. Now you want to change your tune? Or you might be sitting there thinking, you know what? I love God, but my life has not been good at times. As a matter of fact, some of you might be sitting there right now thinking where I'm at in life right now does not feel good. And many people try to, try to twist these verses into meaning puppies and rainbows for everybody all the time. And I think that's a travesty. I think it does a disservice to the Bible. And I think it's an insult to those who are struggling. Because life isn't always good, is it? Yep. Cancer isn't good. Depression isn't good. Drug addiction isn't good. We can go on and on about what's not good. So what is it then that this verse means? I think we could spend a lot of time unpacking this verse. We could talk about the foundation that trials will sometimes build into our lives. In the verses prior to this, Paul is talking about how you can't understand God's ways. You don't even know what you were to pray for. We could talk about that, or we could talk about how these verses go on to say that everything works according to His purpose. But this morning, I want us to focus on the fact that even when times are not good, we rest in the promises of a God who has never let us down. Amen. That God is great, and His grace is sufficient for me. You know, I've had to learn this in my life, and I'd like to tell you that it's a lesson that I have learned perfectly, but it isn't. I'm still learning it, but sometimes I just have to step back and say, you know what, Jesus, you are enough for me. I don't need anything else. Lamentations 3.23 says this, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. 
for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Life may not be good, but we can rest in how great and awesome our God is. And it is his grace only that sustains us. It's the only thing that ever has and the only thing that ever will sustain us. And I hope we can remember that in this season of transition here in this church. That the only thing that has sustained the starting of Church of Christ for the last 37 years is the grace of God. Amen. And the only thing that will sustain us for the next 20, 30, 50 is the grace of God. Amen. And the only thing that will continue to build this church, the only thing that can change this community is if we are a people who are hungry and desperate for that grace and rely solely on His provisions. And so God promises good to those who love Him. God promises salvation in the name of Christ Jesus. Nehemiah 9.17 says this, They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and in their rebellion appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Therefore, you did not desert them. You see, in these verses, we see some of the characteristics of God, don't we? Even before Jesus came to the earth, He was forgiving. He was gracious. He was compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Despite the fact that His chosen people chose to turn from Him time and time again, He made provisions for His return or for their return. And that's what He did for me. That's what He did for you in the person of Jesus Christ. Despite the fact that He knew we were prone to wander, despite the fact that He knew we would turn our backs on Him, He made a provision for us to return to Him. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. I hope we hear one thing this morning, if nothing else. Your salvation, and thanks to God for this, is based on nothing but Jesus. Your works cannot save you. You can't work enough. Being good cannot save you. You cannot be good enough. Whoever stands on this stage, regardless of who it is, does not save you. This church could be reduced to ruins tomorrow and it would have no effect on your salvation, you who call on the name of Jesus. We get caught up sometimes, I think. Things have to be a certain way. If this doesn't go just right, this is going to be catastrophic. It holds no bearing on your future for those whose hope is in Jesus. And so finally, God promises that your reward is eternity with Him. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. Remain steadfast to receive that crown of righteousness. When you lose your job, stand firm and persevere. When the one who was supposed to love you forever walks out the door and never comes back, Stand firm. And when the disease hits and things aren't good, remain in the truth that this world is not your reward. As a matter of fact, it's been said, this life is the closest thing to hell you, Christian, will ever experience. And in Nehemiah 4, when addressing his men, he says this, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Church, we would do well to remember how great and awesome our God is. We rebuild our lives. We continue to build this church on our rock and our cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. This morning, our band's going to come forward. We're going to sing a song of invitation. My prayer is if, if you have never accepted Jesus, if you want to rest in His promises if you have found that His grace will be sufficient for you, I pray that today is the day that you make that decision. 
The water is ready. We have clothes ready. There's nothing holding you back. So this morning, I'm going to pray for us, and then we will sing a song. Father God, I just uh, thank you for this morning that you've given us. Father, uh, we just thank you uh, for Jesus. We just thank you for the grace that comes through him, the mercies that are revealed to us day by day, Father. Father, I pray that, that uh, we don't get caught up in this life, that we don't even get caught up in this church, Father, that we get caught up in Jesus. Father, we thank you for him, and it's in his name that I pray. Amen.